Hello, my name is Kathy Aros, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. On behalf of our league, I would like to welcome all of you to the screening of Suppressed 2020, the fight to vote. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that works to empower and educate citizens on ways to improve our government. This includes presenting unbiased, nonpartisan information about elections, the voting process, and the issues confronting us. This documentary explores voter suppression in Georgia during the 2018 midterm elections, the polling place closures, the long waiting times to vote, voter list purges, and lost absentee ballots, to name just a few. The film puts a human face on those whose vote has been denied them. The film itself is about 40 minutes long and will be followed by a 30 minute question and answer session with our panelists, the director of Suppressed, Robert Greenwald, and Kiara Jackson, who appears in the film. Kiara is a student at Albany State University and was recently voted as Albany Doherty NAACP president. Our moderator today will be Kate Stewart, our league's president elect. Viewers will be able to submit their questions to the panelists using the Q&A function on Zoom. You can locate this Q&A function by hovering your cursor over the bottom of your screen and then just click on Q&A. No need to wait. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. So let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Suppressed 2020, The Fight to Vote. How will I be able to vote without putting my life in danger? The Black Lives Matter actions make voting more important than ever. Will this health crisis become a constitutional crisis? Am I going to be able to vote in November? We have a historic decision today striking down a key part of the Voting Rights Act, a civil rights law passed back in 1965. The Supreme Court essentially said racism is over and these communities don't need to pre-clear these changes anymore. This decision leaves virtually unprotected minority voters in communities all over this country. It let the dogs out. It let these racially discriminatory voting laws to just run wild. Within hours of the Voting Rights Act being gutted, Texas had a new strict photo ID law. And within days, Alabama announced its own repressive voter ID law. We are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression around the country. 200,000 more people would have voted in Wisconsin if not for their strict voter ID law. Voter purges have become rampant. Since the 2016 election, states have removed almost 17 million voters nationwide. You describe Georgia as the epicenter of the current voter suppression battle. What has earned Georgia that distinction? Georgia's tight race for governor is getting national attention. Brian Kemp is not only the Republican gubernatorial nominee, he's Georgia's Secretary of State. Stacey Abrams looking to make history by becoming the nation's first female African-American governor. Volunteers are picking up phones and knocking on doors across the state. Come in and register to vote. We are very excited to register as many people as we possibly can. What do we want? Register to vote! When do we want it? Today! I come as one but I stand as 10,000. Pull back that veneer. And you see something really rotten happening. It's almost like termites coming in. They're in the wood. They're eating the wood away and you don't even realize your house is getting ready to collapse until it's almost too late. We've got to understand, this isn't a clan cross burning. This stuff is very bureaucratic, it's very mundane, it's very routine, but it is lethal. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies. 
skies for amber. My name is Bobby Jenkins. I live in Cuthbert, Georgia. Uh, the county is Randolph County. Uh, I spent about 30, what, almost 35 years in education. My superintendent of schools. My name is Loretta Brown. I live in Morgan, Georgia, and I grew up in Randolph County. I am the state advisor for the Georgia NAACP Youth and College Division. My name is Lewis Brooks. I live in Thomason, Georgia, Upson County, and I've been living here my whole 89 years, except the two years I spent in service in Korea. In 19, I believe it was 55 or 56, that's when they started to let black people vote in Upson County. When I went to register to vote, it was tough. They asked me all kind of questions to try to keep me from registering. I passed the test. Once I got my voter right, I decided I wasn't going to let anything stop me from voting. Because I used to walk. You go up the street here, across the next street over there. I walk over there and walk back and vote. And I didn't miss a voting, except when they closed the poll. I'm, I'm a citizen. It's my right to vote and speak my opinion. I saw this ad saying that there was a proposal to close seven of the nine precincts in Randolph County. I said, what? And then they put it in the papers that they were closing, both costing them too much money. First of all, Randolph is a poor county. Just to give you an example of what it would mean, there's a community of benevolence a little north of town. Uh, had that precinct been closed, some of those individuals would have to go 30 miles round trip in order to vote. It would have been a terrible hardship on our poor, on our elderly, and on those who are least able to afford uh, transportation. You know, I got disabled and I couldn't do no driving. I know I couldn't afford to go that far to vote. This was on a black neighborhood. It made me feel like they were closing down to keep the black people from voting, because most black people vote Democrat. They only the closed one white voting place. Everybody from out here in the black had to go clean over there to the white section to vote. We're human, and we have our rights to vote just like anybody else. Voters in Randolph County, Georgia are outraged. Randolph County residents expressed their concerns with the Board of Elections. Our citizens turned out in full force. They were behind us 100% trying to keep those polling places open. Convenience of the voter. You all are not considering that at all. There's no disenfranchisement for the African Americans. I went to the meeting, find out that they were trying to close seven of the precincts. You got to stand up. You cannot allow this to continue. They gave a couple of reasons, saying it would save money. The other one was that uh, several of the polling places were not ADA compliant. The, the thing that was so ironic is we voted that way in May. You know, they weren't any worse in November than they were in May. It will be impossible for rural voters without vehicles to vote on election day. It will be impossible for them. They will have to walk three and a half hours just to get from one of these polling places to Cuthbert and Shellman. We did petition to keep it open. Pressure from the residents, civil rights organization, speaking up, speaking out. call the meeting to order, and uh, they only had one motion. They voted to keep them open. The news of what was happening here in Randolph County went worldwide. The incident that we experienced threw the spotlight on everything else that had been going on. You know, we find out that in the state of Georgia, there were two over 200 other polling places had been closed. 
If you move a pole four miles, it is the equivalent of a 20% drop in black voter turnout. That's what shutting down these polls mean. With two months to go, the race is heating up in Georgia. Stacey Abrams' campaign feel they have the momentum behind them, and many of the posts we've seen so far support that. You know, the Democrats are working hard, registering all these minority voters, and if they can do that, they can win these elections in November. There's no law in Georgia that requires the Secretary of State to process voter registration forms on a particular timeline. Kemp withheld putting the names of thousands on the voter registration list until after the election. 80% were African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Keep your eyes on the this is Fulton County. Linda Marshall is my name. Most of my professional career has been in public service of one kind or another as a teacher, as a government worker. I moved here in August of this year, but because of my emphasis on always being registered <laughs> and always having the ability to vote, I did that almost immediately when I got here. Of course, I also knew the importance of the upcoming election, and I wanted to be a part of that history. Keep your eyes on it got closer and closer and closer to the election, and I was getting a little bit concerned, so I called the Secretary of State's office. My name is not on the roll. They can't tell me where it is. So all of that paperwork that I sent in, I don't know where it is. I'm 65, and for the first time, I did not get a chance to vote in a very close election of historic importance and proportion. Welcome to Georgia. The midterm election in Georgia is only 29 days away. Civil rights leaders say Kemp is illegally removing people from Georgia's voters list. Republican Brian Kemp has already gotten the backing of our current president. Thousands have purged from Georgia's voters. Purged from Georgia's voting rolls. 890,000. No idea they could vote. Battle is over who's been removed from the voter list. There has been instance after instance of unlawful voter purging. States are removing voters, uh, many of whom have actually been found to have been eligible but were unlawfully removed from the rolls. I received the purge notice. So I open it up and I read the first sentence. Now I, along with 380,000 Georgians, received the same notice. That's an especially pernicious way to prevent people from voting because once you register to vote, you would think that you should be able to remain on the rolls. And once you're removed from the rolls, you cannot vote. I went out and got the mail and there were two letters in there. They looked official. You're hereby notified that the city of Thunderbolt has challenged your right to vote. The city of Thunderbolt states that you no longer reside within the municipality. My license is valid, my address is valid, I own this home. Why are you questioning my right to vote? You know, the purges, they've been going on for decades, maybe over a century in this state. If you haven't voted in the last few elections, they'll purge you as if you must not be in the state anymore. If you move within the same county, 
They'll purge you, assuming you're not living in Georgia anymore. If you don't return a postcard from the Secretary of State, they'll purge you because to them it means you're not a resident at this address. All of these tactics, specifically and disproportionately, target people of color, poor people, the elderly, all of whom tend to vote for Democrats. Brian Kemp is notorious for erasing the polls and purging people right before the election deadline. You have a candidate at the top of the ticket who is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the election. He needed to have his hands on the levers. You have a, an umpire who is also playing in the game. Less than 20 days away from the midterms now. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss-up. Literally is a dead heat. This governor's race is already won for the history books, but it's also seeing record numbers of requests for absentee ballots, especially from African-American voters. At a time where we're seeing roughly almost half of the people who've turned in an absentee ballot are people of color, that's a really, really good sign for Stacey Abrams. We caught them off guard by running such a large-scale program and mailed 1.6 million African Americans an absentee ballot and application. In this midterm election, the absentee ballot requests are even outperforming presidential years. So that is, that is startling and eye-popping and something that we need to dig in on to see what's going on there. My name is Norman Broderick, and I'm in Potter Springs, Georgia, Cobb County. I did 24 years in the military, deployed to Iraq twice, Bosnia, Saudi Arabia. I voted absentee before when I was deployed. When I was in Iraq the first time, I voted absentee, and when I was in Iraq the second time, I voted absentee. The absentee ballot is a very important tool that exists to allow people, not only just the military, but anybody who happens to be away from their voting station, to be able to cast a vote. My name is Peggy Hsu. Uh, I'm from Johns Creek, Georgia. I left Georgia for DC in the beginning of October. And before I left, I mailed out my absentee ballot application so that our registrar would send an absentee ballot to my new DC address. I work at a US Army Central, which is located at Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina. I'm away from home during the week. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get back to Georgia to vote. I could only do this absentee. I filled out everything I was supposed to fill out. I sent their documents in. I got confirmation that it was received. And to my surprise, I did not receive my absentee ballot. I checked my mailbox every day. It was like nearing the end of the month. Um, and so I started calling the voter protection hotline. I called my registrar. I sent emails and it was really, really getting close to the election date and I just, I never received my ballot. The election day came and went and I wasn't able to vote in the end. When I contacted my wife and asked her about it, um, I think it was a couple of days before the election, it came here and I tried contacting the Georgia Elections Board. I was told they did receive my absentee ballot request. Everything was filled out correctly, but that they mailed it to the wrong address. And she admitted that yes, they did mess up. It was their fault, but there was nothing I could do about it. It's too late. It's over with, and my vote will not be counted during this election. It was probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever experienced. After having spent, you know, my entire college career very invested in the political process, it was, I don't know, like a punch to the gut. It still pisses me off to this day. Being in Baghdad, voting absentee was easier than being four hours away trying to vote absentee in South Carolina. I took to Facebook and like the millennial activist that I am, I recounted my experience in a Facebook post. I wrote, this is what happened. I wasn't able to vote and if you had a similar experience, let me know. And my friend from high school, she reached out to me and she said, I also had struggles trying to get my ballot in voting absentee. So I submitted an absentee ballot. It came two days right before election day. Over the course of 48 hours, we had 40 people 
so many people in our immediate Facebook circle knew somebody who had a similar experience to us. People have requested it like far in advance. Some people just didn't get their vote in. So that was when we really realized that this was not an isolated incident. It was a much bigger issue and a much more deeper rooted sort of phenomenon that was going on statewide. I did speak with the Board of Elections and he just dismissed it as like a hiccup and he's like, oh, like, no, you don't really know what you're talking about. 40 cases, not really a hiccup. It's more of like a wake up call. Today, we've worked to get answers about the claim that thousands of voters never got the absentee ballots they requested. The race between Abrams and Kemp is literally neck and neck. Their fate is now in the hands of voters. The day is finally upon us. The midterm elections are happening. Voters head to the polls in one of the most intensely fought midterm elections. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss up. I live in the South. I'm always worried about election day. Have a great morning and go vote. Oh yeah, go, go vote today. Voting started here in Georgia this morning, and if you think hitting the polls early will keep you from getting stuck on long lines, think again. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? I've never seen one. The line hasn't moved in over an hour. I really thought I was going to be able to run in and run out like I usually do. The first thing I saw was just people everywhere. So we stood there for a while without moving. And then we would inch up. And then we wouldn't move. We had a lot of people with children there, pregnant mothers, elderly people. Some people have medical issues. I took my son to school that morning. And then I went to vote at Ferguson Elementary, where I vote every election. The line was so long through the school and wrapped around the building. The lines was crazy everywhere, all over the county. It was real long. I was in line for two hours. I got to the door. That's when they was checking your ID before you go in. And she couldn't find my name. She directed me to go downtown Gwinnett. And I was like, I'm not going to vote. And it was this older lady. She came over and she like held my hand and was like, Please go do it. We need this. And I looked in her eyes and said, I will. About eight or nine, we started getting the calls about the long lines. Mm -hmm. Long lines at the polling stations lead to low voter turnout. The research is just crystal clear on that. Everyone in the world knew we were going to vote today. And in my neighborhood, there are no power cords. All these dedicated people waiting to vote. This is what we call voter suppression. People were like upset and angry. I started calling the Secretary of State's office. I was either hung up on, placed on hold. They want people to go home and not vote. I ain't going nowhere. I'm gonna be right here. The reason they sent me from Ferguson to the downtown Gwinnett was for the provisional vote. So I drove 25 minutes, and then when I got there, it was crowded in there. I waited 45 minutes to find out that's not where I needed to be. She told me that this was the wrong place and that I can go back to Ferguson. I had to call back and redo my schedule. So now the voting not only cut on my time, cut on my money. When we went in, filled out all the paperwork, had the ID, took it up to the lady. I had mine in my hand. One hand had hers in the other, because mm -hmm. she's legally blind. So we go give it to the lady, and she goes to scan Barbara's ID. Wow. So she looked up at Barbara. She said, well, Miss Barbara, when was the last time you voted? <laughs> My sister got strong. I've been no, voting since really. I was 18 years old, <laughs> and I'm 82. Yeah, I was disappointed. She was a little upset. Um, My girl wanted well, to vote and they were trying to yeah. keep her from voting. Since I became a citizen, I have not missed an election. I showed up and a very nice lady, she looked at my ID and said, no, you're not registered. And I said, no, no, wait a second. Here's my registration card and show them that I was registered. And they said, yeah, but your name is Del Rio with a space. 
but your voter ID says Del Rio one word, and therefore it doesn't match. It's in the voter registration, my name shows as Del Rio with a space. My ID is Del Rio no space. That was a non-match. I said, this is not legal and I need to be allowed to vote. After much discussion, they said to me, this time we'll allow you to vote, but it's a little bit like they're doing me a favor. The right to vote should be something that we should make easier rather than more difficult. Latinos and Asian Americans are six times more likely than white Georgians to be cut from the voter rolls because of exact match. And black Americans are eight times more likely to be cut because of exact match. I have voted in every election and all of a sudden I'm not there. Controversy surrounds the state's exact match law that put the registrations of 53,000 voters, most of them African Americans, on hold because of discrepancies in the way their names are spelled in state databases. People of color have names that are a little bit less uh, typical, and that's where the errors are at their highest. Brian Kemp knows this. A group of students will not have their voices heard at the polls, at least not in Georgia. They're turning a bunch of students away over here. We're showing up here in, at the Booker T. Washington location, um, and their names were not on the actual roll. The students were being turned away. I talked to over 50 students that morning. First, they told me I was at the wrong polling station. They said, You're, uh, you didn't get registered. I was like, what do you mean? And there was only about, like, what, four voting ballot booths? They didn't process my registration, my registration didn't go through. I walked back to my dorm and said, you know, I guess I just won't vote. Just before I went to vote, I had been in an African American history class where we were actually talking about voter suppression, you know, about what was it like for people that were going to vote. I filled out a little slip of paper, gave it to the poll workers. They looked up at me and they said, it's coming up in our system as though you're not a citizen of the United States. I just sort of looked at them like they had two heads. Like, I'm sorry, I was born in New York, what? When I got to the front of the line, they informed me that I was registered to vote, but not in Doherty County. They were telling me that I was registered back home in Winter Robins, where I was from, and I've never voted there. I've never even been registered there. The thing was that I had brought proof that I was a US citizen. I had with me my driver's license, my passport card, and my Emory student ID, but they would not look at the passport card whatsoever to prove that I was a citizen. I walked out crying. What I learned in history class just hours before, this happened to me in 2018. I had been through and it participated in voter registration drive on campus within the community. It was just like, wow, after all of this, I'm not gonna be able to vote myself. Like when I was growing up, Voting was a thing, it was an event. It's a little me is trailing behind my parents watching them vote. My parents would take me to the voting polls every time when I was little. I would go in and I would help them fill out the bubbles. I get a chance to vote and then you get there and the experience is just terrible and you have to call your mom and be like, why is this so hard? You never told me it would be this hard. This was huge for us because Stacey Abrams was actually a Spelman alum. History would have been made and it would have been made by my Spelman sister. If there is no one who gets to 50% tonight, Robin, there will be a runoff in December. We'll find out as the day and evening goes on. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Are they letting you know this now? Are you really kidding me? Old people who can't vote, there's young people who can't vote, there's people in every county who can't vote. It just created this intense fog of confusion across the state. In here for three hours, four or five hour wait, five hours. This is way, way too long for us to stay uh, and vote. How long have you waited in line here? About three and a half hours. Have you decided you can't stand it? You can't take it anymore? Are you going to go home? Um, I'm hurting. I, I'll be back. I got to go take some medicine. It was really good. Uh, the lines weren't too long and everyone was super helpful. We don't hardly ever have to wait here. It's always a pleasant experience up here. If you have a fixed resource, an easy way to suppress the vote is to just make that resource unavailable to the people who you don't want to vote. And that's exactly what happened in the 2018 election here in, in the state of Georgia. In places like North Fulton County, which are wealthy, there were more machines than anyone could ever use. In black neighborhoods, there were a quarter of the number of machines that were needed to service the population. Lots of people left without voting. It was people just dropping off when it became two hours, three hours, fourth hour. It was very heartbreaking. All it takes is a little walking away 
at 159 counties to influence an election. Little here, little there. And then in a race like this, which was so close, there you go. All night on Twitter, a trending topic, hashtag stay in line. I had to go and pick my son up. He had to be picked up at four, six. I picked my son up and he went with me and sat in the car. And then I went back to Ferguson Elementary. And by this time, the evening crowd is there and the line has tripled. And I was like, oh, there is no way. Just for my one vote, it took me like six hours. And I wanted to give up because I promised that elderly lady outside that I would do it. Five hours, so about five hours, took me to vote. It sucks the life out of you. I'd been in people's homes, I'd been in their neighborhoods, I'd held their hands. And so to get to election night, and to start hearing more and more stories of voter suppression, to hear more and more from people who were told they couldn't vote or who were turned away or had to give up because of four hour lines. That broke my heart. Republican Brian Kemp holds a narrow lead over Democrat Stacey Abrams. The tens of thousands of ballots left to be counted in this election. They were counting provisional ballots for hours. Provisional ballots are basically placebos. They're being given to voters to kind of um, shut them up, make them go away. The next day, I was so excited because they were saying that it was a close race. So I was like, oh, let me make sure that my vote count. So I called there the number that was on the paper that I got from the voting poll. And she go, oh no, they counting every vote. You don't need to call. I call my mom to double check. My mom worked for the poll for 20 some years. And she said, no, that's not true. You call back to make sure the vote count. And someone else says to the phone, and I got the same thing. No, you don't need to call back. We counting all the votes. We just started discovering so many people voting provisionally. We realized, oh, you voted provisionally, so you might have to come back here the next day and show your ID. Is that something you know? And they're like, no, no, I already voted. Like, I'm, I'm good. But you have to come back within three days with the documentation to prove you are who you say you are. When you have a large working class population that has to punch a clock, that's really tough. You've lost pay from work trying to vote. That's a poll tax. I wanted to confirm if my vote was counted or not. All right, what is your last name? Kimball. Let's see, there was no participation. Um, so does that- You weren't given credit for voting. My vote was not counted. It looks like it on the election day, yes ma'am. Uh, yes. No, I thank you, uh, goodbye. Last night, my opponent ended her campaign. The election is over, and I'm honored to be Georgia's governor-elect. I acknowledge that former Secretary of State Brian Kemp will be certified as the victor in the 2018 gubernatorial election. But to watch an elected official baldly pin his hopes for election on the suppression of the people's democratic right to vote has been appalling. This is not a speech of concession. Because concession means to acknowledge an action is right, true, or proper. As a woman of conscience and faith, I cannot concede that. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Georgia 2018 
was a case study of voter suppression. And as we approach the 2020 elections, we're seeing a coordinated effort to suppress from lawyers, millions of dollars, and potentially the biggest tool of all, the coronavirus. The coronavirus pandemic is creating concerns ahead of the 2020 election with no official end in sight to the crisis. There are questions about whether voters will be able to head to the polls to cast their ballot in November. Out of a large city of Milwaukee, we almost got 600,000 people in the city limits. They only have five polling sites open during a pandemic. In Wisconsin today, thousands waiting for hours forced to choose between protecting their own health and exercising their right to vote. This is so wrong. This is just so wrong. Stop playing politics with our lives. The 2020 primary in Georgia was like the 2018 election all over again. This is primary day in Georgia. Lines in Atlanta stretching for blocks. There were people and seniors who had been sitting out waiting to vote for more than five hours. This is wrong. This is America. I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. If you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. We are not going to let them take from us what our grandparents and parents fought and suffered and died to give us in the first place. We are here to resist an ID law that is undemocratic, unconstitutional, and immoral. People are demanding democracy. New Mexico now has same-day voter registration. Iowa, Colorado, Nevada, Florida, and Arizona all passed laws restoring voting rights to those formerly incarcerated. Maine has enacted automatic voter registration. Delaware and Virginia enacted early in-person voting. And in response to the coronavirus pandemic, Michigan, Illinois, New Hampshire, and California have all committed to expanding mail-in and absentee voting in the 2020 election. We belong together. We are all part of the fabric of this country, and we understand what's at stake. Any voter suppression law is not just about black people, it is about America itself. On my mother's dying bed at 92 years old, former sharecropper, her last words were, do not let them take our votes away from us. No one should have to risk their life to vote. And for the politicians that put you in front of a coronavirus firing squad, vote them out. From
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, we're so excited that you all are here today to join us to watch this film and have this discussion. Um, my name is Kate Stewart. Um, I'm the president-elect of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Um, I think you'll all agree that this film, Suppressed, was uh, really incredible. Um, it's kind of heartbreaking, and um, I think it left us all probably feeling uh, really outraged um, if you weren't already aware of the situation that was going on in Georgia. Um, just a reminder, um, we're going to be asking some questions to our two panelists today. Um, you can also ask your own questions. Just um, go to the bottom of your screen in Zoom, and there's a little Q&A feature there you can click on and submit your own questions to us, and we can ask those too. Um, so today, um, we should be having two guests. Right now, we have one. We're hoping that um, Robert Greenwald will join us soon. Um, Robert um, has a long career as a film producer and film director. He founded great, uh, Brave New Films in 2002, um, which is a nonprofit and nonpartisan um, film production company. It's out in California in Culver City. Um, he's, some of the films he's done before include Unprecedented, the 2000 election, the 2000 presidential election, Outfoxed, Rupert Murdoch's War on Journalism, and The Real McCain about our own Senator John McCain from Arizona. Um, so hopefully Robert will be joining us um, soon. Uh, but we also have Kiara Jackson. I'm really excited to have her. Um, she probably looks familiar to you because um, she was in the film. And she was in that part about um, students um, who were not able to um, vote in their, they wanted to be able to vote where they were going to school. And uh, some of them were not able to do that. Um, and Kiara was one of those students. Um, so she's still a student at Albany State University. Um, she's also um, was is now the president of the Albany Doherty County branch of the NAACP. Um, so we're really excited that Kira is, is here to join us. Um, so since Kira is here, we're gonna ask her some questions. Um, let's see, I was just really curious how you got to be in the film and did, did Robert just show up at Albany? So um, basically um, I, work with a, a closely uh, knit group of, of activists in the Albany community, and I believe uh, the director might have reached out to one of those people and uh, expressed or offered or told them about, you know, the film that he had been working on and asked if anybody they knew had had any experiences um, at the polls and, you know, that weren't able to vote or just any, any type of problems that were encountered, if they'd be willing to share their story. And um, being that, you know, what suppression was something that I was well aware of and knew was prevalent in South Georgia, but didn't uh, really couldn't see myself experiencing or didn't know that I would soon to, ex soon to exper experience it uh, come that election, um, I, I decided that that was going to be the opportunity for me to tell my story, just, you know, to debunk any myths that, you know, what suppression was or if it was prevalent in South Georgia, because I could testify to it. Yeah, okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, must be great. Do you feel like you're famous now? And <laughs> uh, not, not yet. Uh, I'm just glad to be able to uh, broaden the conversation around voter suppression and just, just let people know this is something that we as Georgians are, are still facing, especially in this upcoming election. Yeah, I know that there, the film came out, there's like an earlier version that came out earlier this year. Were you all able to attend like a screening together? Uh, yes, there was a screening, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend due to uh, some branch business that I had to send you okay. back in the morning. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure you're really busy. Really I wish I could, could have attended. Yeah. Um, I think we're all really curious to know, since you're such a, you know, really involved in what's going on there now, um, has anything changed as far as um, people's access to be able to vote right now for this election? Is it any so easier? Is it any harder? Interesting enough, uh, I believe COVID-19 has shaken up everybody's world and we're still trying to figure out how to navigate um, as a city uh, around, uh, you know, still making sure that people have access to the ballots during this global pandemic. So what we have been pushing locally um, as a branch and as, um, as an association is making sure uh, absent ba absentee ballots are uh, mailed out appropriately on time. People that are uh, filling out their applications to have those received, and as well as drop boxes. 
Drop boxes are something that we're heavily pushing, especially in the Albany Doherty County area, because Albany was one of the areas that was hit the hardest by COVID-19. So uh, what we are pushing for is to make sure that there is at least one drop box at um, all public libraries for those who don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, going out to the polls to vote or may not have, you know, transportation or whatever the situation may be, making sure that people have equal access um, for the election to be able to cast their ballot. Oh, that's great. Um, we saw the 2018 election. Do you know, I mean, are you aware of what happened with, with all those lawsuits? Um, I'm not uh, entirely sure about the result. Like, I know we do, we have had some wins, and I think we, um, I've been uh, active in fair fights, uh, litigation battles with um, the state in Brian Kemp. So, uh, and had actually been involved in a deposition as well. So being able to give my testament to the events that happened, um, the gubernatorial election was something that was important for me to be able to uh, make a tangible win um, in this fight for democracy for the state of Georgia. But um, I'm not entirely sure about the, where okay. we are in that process. Yeah, I'm sure some of that may still be going on. Um, yeah. So, oh, somebody just wanted to ask about the drop boxes. Um, how are they... How do you know that they're being secured and protected when people drop their ballots in? So the one drop box that we do have in Albany is currently housed at our government building system, which, is, uh, which has video surveillance, uh, which is also what they're required to do by law. And uh, another way to give people more access to those things is putting them in public places like libraries that are funded by the city and uh, making sure that you know, people do feel secure with the surveillance and everything going on. Uh, that their vote is being protected. And also, I do know that there are, um, there are specific times where people come by and, uh, you know, survey the drop boxes as well as pick them up and uh, turn in any applications or, or ballots that have been turned in to make sure, you know, that they're not being uh, messed with or tampered with in any way. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um... I wanted to know what exactly the NAACP, your NAACP branch, or the, the kind of statewide NAACP, what specifically are you guys trying to do right now? Do you have any new projects, new activities that you're trying to do right now to increase voter registration or access right now? Absolutely. So on the branch level, we're kind of mirroring our national um, efforts. So that, uh, what that looks like is making sure that we've got people in place that are uh, phone banking and we've even implemented a new SMS program to send text out to people asking if they would help us and, and uh, gaining volunteers to help uh, continue our get out of the boat efforts as well as voter education efforts, which is something that we are specifically uh, trying to implement on the branch level, making sure that the people in the area are um, aware about the, the history of voting and why it is important to vote and making sure we continue to galvanize around the issues that are, are plaguing the nation and our, and our community specifically. So um, making sure that um, we have those, those um, infrastructures in place to continue to build capacity in this work that we're doing to help get people civically engaged. Yes, a lot, of, a lot of grassroots organizing involved and coalition building as well, making sure that we reach out to other organizations that are doing the same work that we're doing so that we're not reinventing the wheel and making sure that we're maximizing on our efforts uh, for this, this turnout for this election. Definitely, okay. Um, somebody wanted to know, um, you know, there were a lot of polling locations in the film we saw that were closed, ones like in Randolph County and other places. Have any of those been reopened since 2018? Um, I know a few might have, um, have been, being, having undergone uh, like, a, what do you call it, refurbishing, but um, for the most part, a lot of those precincts that I've seen on that list have remained closed. Okay. Yeah. Is there any effort to help those people? I mean, I know they have to drive really far. Any effort to, I mean, I know with COVID, right, nobody mm -hmm. wants to like ride in a car with some random person or mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I know in Georgia, it's, it can be difficult to vote absentee. So is there, are there alternatives for getting people there? Absolutely. One thing that we are, are pushing for to help one pe get people more civically engaged is making sure people understand that in order to get these uh, 
precincts back open that do require funding, but making sure their city council and uh, the leaders in their local ordinances know that there's funding available in order to uh, assist these, these civic engagement project, um, projects. So um, reaching out to your local, um, uh, not authorities, but your local, you know, city leaders, letting them know that um, voting is something that you all are prioritizing and uh, it's something that we need access to uh, across the board. So making sure that they are also advocating for the needs of the community. And if that is um, either improving the polling locations that are already in place or advocating for more, uh, more conveniently or more access, more accessible polling places, that uh, they are prioritizing those needs. Okay. Um, I kind of wondered, I mean, um... I know that going back to, I think it was in 1961, there was this thing called the Albany Movement. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Some other people listening in may even remember going back to the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, a lot of voter registration efforts, some that were um, pretty violent um, and unsuccessful back then. I was wondering, um, how does it feel to be here uh, 60 years later almost? to be doing kind of similar work now in the same place um, as a young um, person, you know. Honestly, it's, it's so surreal for me, and uh, I don't take uh, my position nor this moment lightly, especially being um, in a city like Albany. Like you said, there was such, so much historical context there, but um, I do feel a, a lot of strength and support to be, to be able to have conversations with people that do remember the movement so that um, I could take notes from them on how to better organize, better galvanize around these issues from people that have been in the area that have fought these same battles. And, you know, it, it's, it's really a blessing and an and honor to be able to still, to be able to, to reach back into the community, to be able to talk to these people and, you know, gain so much knowledge and wisdom and just, you know, leadership qualities as well while I continue to push Albany forward uh, for more progressive issues, especially. So it, it's definitely a great experience. Okay, that's great. Um, so we have an, a question. Let's see, somebody wants to know, um, does Georgia have an early voting season where you can go to the polls early? like starting in, in October? Yes, I believe the first day that we are able to vote early is on October the 8th, which I will be doing. Good, I hope we can do it this year. So are you, are you still registered? Are you registered in Albany County or where you, were, where you grew up? I'm currently registered in Albany, thankfully. I actually just checked up on my, my voter page yesterday to make sure that my information was there. But um, I contemplated whether or not I was going to uh, fill out an absentee ballot because I'm currently um, in Warner Robins, uh, where I'm from. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and make the trip back just to participate in some poll watching activities as well, making sure that we're doing our part to, you know, secure, you know, this democratic process for our own community. So being a part of those efforts and then also going to uh, cast my vote as well. Yeah, we're trying to do here, trying to get more young people to be poll workers and, and poll watchers. Is the same thing going on there? You are more young? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, like I said, we, we coalesced with uh, like Black Voters Matters and uh, the New Georgia Project, um, trying to, you know, solicit more younger poll workers and people that are represented in the communities that they're going to be working in as well. So that's an effort that we've been pushing out to all of the local college and universities, one being uh, my University of Albany State and uh, the other local school, Albany Technical um, College. So that is something that we are still currently investing in, as well as partnering with uh, the ACLU um, on these efforts, making sure that we have the infrastructure in place to be able to uh, accept these new poll workers and kind of uh, manage our own uh, network of, of poll workers. Cool. Um, I know that the race, you know, with Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, it was really disappointing um, for a lot of people who had supported her. And there was, there was a pretty big turnout um, for her. Do you think, I was just kind of curious what you think the turnout will be in Georgia this year? And also, are there any races in particular that you, you are watching closely and that you want to see, you know, how Hmm. 
So g- give me one word. Could you sure. repeat that? I'm sorry, I was, it was a bit. It's kind of all on you. I, I think Robert is still not here. He may be having some difficulties getting in. Okay. But um, could you repeat the question? Sure. I wanted to know, um, I mean, the, the election between um, Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp was super close. Um, it's kind of a razor thin election. And I wondered if there are any races in the state or locally that you're, you're following really closely and you think the turnout will, will make all the difference. Um, right now, currently all of my efforts uh, are focused on this national election in November. So that's, that's the, the turnout that I'm, I'm most excited to see, especially because I know I'm expecting a lot of younger voters um, in our area with all of the efforts that we've been doing in the Albany and uh, Southwest Georgia area. So uh, stay tuned for, for November. And that's where we're at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we have another question about um, how does the governor, Governor Kemp, how does he interacting with um, voters who are people of color now? And I guess people who are trying to register is, I'm not sure exactly how to. <laughs> Okay, I think I, I get a good gist of, of what, what's being asked. Um, I do believe our Governor Brian Kemp uh, realizes that there is a, a large spotlight, especially on Georgia, concerning this election. And, uh, you know, knows that a lot of people are not happy with the results. But um, from what I've witnessed, especially with his um, involvement with the NAACP, is he's trying to be more transparent and, and provide more access. Um, for these elections coming up and making sure that uh, he is doing his part uh, to make sure that uh, across state lines that, you know, if there is funding needed, if uh, there are more polling locations to be, you know, funded and so on and so forth. But I believe he is doing his part. Yeah. It just occurred to me, I don't even know right now who is the Secretary of State for Georgia and is that person approached um, voting rights any differently than Brian Kemp did? Um, the name escapes me actually right now at this, at this point, but um, from what I do know, I believe there have been efforts to rectify the, the thousands of, of names that have been purged from uh, the voter logs. Um, that is something we're also uh, watching very closely. Uh, especially be, because of what had happened in the 2018 gubernatorial election. So, uh, and making sure that the My Voter page is, is frequently updated to reflect people's current um, uh, voter applications and making sure even though we are currently experiencing, you know, like a national U.S. Uh, postal system right. issue. So. Once, once again, we, we've got we've got eyes on on the ground with that. Good. Um, this is a really great question. One that you know, as president elect, I'm hoping maybe next year we can we can do more um, and work, work more with our local NAACP group. I kind of we wondered if you're working with any of your local um, League of Women Voter groups, or do you have any ideas of how those two organizations could be working together more? So uh, I have to say this is my my first time hearing of the League of Women Voters. So uh, this is an organization that I'm not uh, too familiar with, but I do know we, especially when it comes to civic engagement, the NAACP nationally as well as local audiences are always open to, you know, coalescing with uh, like-minded institutions that are, you know, have the same purpose, uh, whether it is exposing voter suppression for what it is or voter education. Um, I'm sure we'll be more than happy on the state, uh, national and local levels to assist or to work with you all um, in any of those efforts. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I hope in the future we should, we should be doing a lot more together. Absolutely. Um, and also in general, I mean, you know, as a, as a league, we do a whole lot locally um, for voter registration in Arizona, um, voter education. Um, right now, I think a lot of us are just completely swamped with, <laughs> with doing stuff all the time, getting ready for the election. But, you know, we see a film like this and it leaves us just, I mean, like my, I've seen this film actually several times now, but every time it's like my blood pressure rises and I just feel so outraged. And it makes me wonder, you know, what can people like us, even though we're really far away, what can we be doing to support you guys in Georgia and what you're trying to do? 
Um, is there any like little actions that we can be doing from home to help you out? Ooh, that is an excellent question. So what that work looks like, um, especially as we, um, as an association and as branches, become more intentional with the work that we do on a local level, um, is going to look different for each region, for each state, for each, for each county. So for Albany, like I said, one of the things that we're pushing for is making sure that there are enough uh, drop boxes in the city so that, you know, access um, is equitable across the board. Um, one thing that we could have more, more help on is contacting our local officials, um, our city commission and county commission as well, as we continue to advocate for these issues. And what we're also in the process of culminating is, you know, a sort of action item that uh, tells people the issues that we're galvanizing around and also puts our local leaders information on there so they can be reached out to directly so that they understand like how serious it is. Um, that we receive funding, that we receive these drop boxes um, in order to have a successful election. Um, I know we're, <laughs> we're working on that here too. Um, so I wondered too, besides, so we've got the NAACP. Um, one, you know, I know Stacey Abrams has a group, it's called Fair Fight or Fair Fight Action, something like that. Yeah. What other groups in Georgia are there? Um, doing work to help help people get registered and to vote. Absolutely. So of course we've got the ACLU Georgia. We also have a, an organization called Black Voters Matter, as well as um, Nine to Five Georgia. What was that? And then lastly, the, this is one that I know for sure, the New Georgia Project. All of these organizations, um, from my knowledge, are nonprofit organizations that do uh, community work. But some of them specialize in civic engagement for specific demographics, um, as well as uh, specific areas. Okay, that's great. Um, well, I guess Robert is not going to join us. Um, and it looks like Kiera is maybe frozen. Yes, <laughs> oh, <he's back. laughs> frozen. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Um, and I wondered, one last question I wanted to ask you, do you feel like more hopeful this year about everything or, or not? <laughs> um, I believe uh, the 2018 election was a wake up call for us. And I believe that we as an association uh, mapped, up, mapped out a plan and decided to execute early. So to, you know, fair for the maximum turnout to, you know, the best favorable I vote, <laughs> outcome of this, this election, which is uh, great turnout, especially youth turnout and um, access to the polls despite this pandemic. I do feel a lot more hopeful because um, I feel like we have had the opportunity once again to coalesce with other organizations, kind of put our, put our efforts together to maximize um, the turnout for this year. Um, I know a lot of organizations have started this work back uh, last year and, and beyond, building the infrastructure, building a volunteer base uh, in order to really make this a successful election year. So yes, I do feel uh, more hopeful than, than this past election. Oh, well, good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to wrap up now. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, and I wanted to say a few words about... Um, this, this film was originally, we were gonna show this film in person last April, which seems like such a long time ago. Um, we were gonna show it at The Loft, our local cinema, as part of a series um, that we were, of events we were gonna do to celebrate the year 2020, which was, is the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters, and also the 19th Amendment, which we know granted most women the right to vote, but not really all women to vote. We kind of borrowed from Iowa, of all places. Um, a group there came up with this, this great slogan called Hard One, Not Done, um, which is kind of how we wanted to approach this. Like we wanted to celebrate all the work that suffragists had done 100 years ago to earn the 19th Amendment. However, the work is not done. It's really not. 100 years later, we're still out here fighting to make sure that everyone can vote um, in an equal way, have equal access um, and to make it easy for everyone. Um, so before we go, I'd like to thank everyone who made this possible today. We had a lot of work going on behind the scenes, um, especially uh, Kathy Eros, um, Rex Graham, Jeremy Brittle, Susan Black, 
um, and Bev Klein. They're all um, league members who made this happen. Um, Natalie Stone from Brave New Films. Um, if you'd like to um, get more involved, of course, join your local league, join the NAACP, check out more films on Brave New Films. Um, there's lots of, of voting rights organizations you can get involved in and they need your help, you know, immediately. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank Kiara Jackson for joining us today and, and sharing um, her story and, all, and everything that she's doing in Georgia. And we wish her the best of luck for this election. We're really, we're rooting for you <laughs> here in Arizona. <laughs> and we hope that you guys have a really successful election there. And we hope that everyone out there is inspired to, uh, to get to work. Um, so thank you all, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks.